Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Lender Lounge with Kevin Kim. Thank you for joining us today. We've got one of my favorite clients and good friend of mine, Greg Hebner with Arixa. Welcome, Greg. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. So, you know, the usual format for, you know, for this for this podcast is kind of we're just going to you know, have some fun, talk a little bit about Orixa, a little, get to know you a little bit better um, and maybe talk about some current events and some issues and, you know, get your thoughts on where the industry is headed. So let's just jump right into it. So first of all, I mean, give us kind of like, you know, uh, you know, who you are and, uh, you know, what your company, you know, what Orixa does and the usual intro. And then we'll, I'll start poking and prodding a little bit. <laughs> sounds, sounds good. Um, well, yeah. I've been working uh, kind of in the real estate industry since right out of college, off and on, uh, full-time, started flipping houses in high volume uh, around 2010, and was a very, very active flipper for uh, about three years, and met Jan Bresky, who had started Ericsa, actually back in 06, but his first fund in 2010. We've, we met in 2011, started working on a... Uh, single family rental fund in 2012 and then started working together full-time on the lending side in 2013. Mm -hmm. So then I guess full-time as a private lender since then, hard to believe it's been that long. We've, uh, you know, we've always tried to come at it a little bit differently in terms of how we try to build the platform as a borrower who's borrowed from many, many, many other lenders. I've always tried to incorporate the things that I appreciated about uh, the lenders I worked with and Try to keep sort of the borrower friendly attitude to the extent you could. I think you know, right. what do the borrowers really care about? Uh, so we've been, uh, you know, an acquisition and construction lender since then. Uh, we added multifamily to the business uh, a few years later and uh, mostly focus on the West Coast. You know, as you know, as a longtime service provider of ours, the business has grown a lot over, over the years. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's you know, kind of a rich uh, in, a, in a nutshell. So Arix has always been a lending company, but you guys have you guys have kind of expanded your off product offerings over the years, right? I mean, did you guys start in the fix and flip space first, or was it you know we started adding because you guys do commercial real estate now, you guys do construction, you guys do residential. Has it always been that way, or was it just was it just residential only? How did that evolve? Yeah, it was in the beginning. It was we went to the people who bought at the trustee sale. It was right. very. Uh, average loan sizes in the hundred and two hundred thousand dollar range, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, very much, I think, a way a lot of folks got started in the business. Uh, and the one thing we always did is we always were a balance. We've always come at it as an investment management firm, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, an alternative investment management firm. So we wanted our own balance sheet from the very first day. Yeah, it was obviously very constricting when you didn't have a lot of a, a lot of money to lend. Right. Um, what really transformed, I think, our business was we partnered with, um, uh, you know, a, a commercial real estate investor and launched another vehicle called Crosswind in 2013, which really allowed us to do larger loans, mm -hmm. uh, bigger construction loans. We were doing one to five million dollar SFR mm -hmm. loans, and we're probably one of the very few companies in the space back then who could do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it really, it really became the catalyst to be able to do a lot more. We've always done a lot of renovation. That's my background. And construction has always been an important part. But we had our first ground up in 2015, Kevin, I think. Mm -hmm. if I right. And then multifamily, we did the one in 15. And by 2016 and 17 added. And by last year, it was you know nearly half of our business. So we have right. a, a pretty nice mix now between multifamily and uh, residential with a little bit of other commercial assets, but mostly single family and, and multifamily. The listeners, our audience like to hear, learn more about kind of like how you came up as, as, as a builder first. You were in real estate right out of college, you said? So you, you were- no I, was, no, I was actually, I was an accountant out of college. So um, yeah, you calling me a builder would be a, a far cry because I don't know which side of the hammer is up. But um, <laughs> I, I was actually, you know, it's funny, my, my affinity for real estate started, I got a VA loan on the property. I was in the Marine Corps and got a mm -hmm. VA loan out of college to buy an $81,000 house in the city of Indianapolis where my first job was. And I, I think I put down two grand and I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a second, I get, I get to borrow $79,000. I'm a 22 year old kid, it's a lot of money back then. And if it just goes up by a couple percent a year, 
I'm doubling my money. Right. So, you know, as a math guy, that math worked for me very well. So right. I, I bought and sold probably 10 or 15 homes, had a bunch of rental properties, actually sold some rental properties to pay for Harvard Business School, helped to fund my tuition, and then went into corporate America for a very long time. But always, you know, I had a small little real estate fund I had in the side and mm-hmm. was always in SFR, always fixing things and leasing mm-hmm. things and renting things. And just, it felt like I'm not a very good stock market uh, picker. I've decided mm-hmm. over the last 20 plus years. So I could get my arms around real estate and values and the math made sense to me, you know, and it, it, it's always been something I've had a you know great affinity to. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't until 2010, it became like a full-time career as an investment mm-hmm. you know, manager, if you will. But, uh, you know, a lot of 20 years prior to that, just doing it, you know, as I could with my full-time work. So you, it was basically a kind of like a side hustle while you were working in corporate America for a while. Yeah. I, I don't private know investing. Cool I'm not if I'm cool enough to have a hustle, but yeah, it was, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it was not my full-time job. It, it was right. not my W2 paycheck. So you were, were you, were you, were you like a CPA for a while? Were you, were you, were you doing, were you doing yeah. that or? Yeah. My, my, my exciting job out of college. So my, my dad was an engineer and basically his lesson was, um, if you're going to spend the next four years of your life getting a degree, you better get a degree where you know you're going to get a job. So you can be an right. engineer like me or do something in business. And I was better at math than I was at science. And, right. uh, you know, I liked business and had an affinity to that. So I got an accounting and finance degree, went to work for Pricewaterhouse, went to work for ah. a corporate, a big corporate group and like a kind of internal audit process improvement and did a lot of traveling before I went to business school. But um, I actually came back after business school and I was a CFO for a small period of time mm-hmm. in the late nineties. But, uh, you know, I, I know enough to be dangerous now, not enough to, to actually do those jobs anymore. But it was a great trade. Well, you recruited a pretty, pretty strong staff around, I mean, a pretty strong we, we, we have. You know, accounting staff and your internal, you know, you're, you're all those people that I, I know who work on the uh, you know tax and accounting and your CPA team, your audit team, they're all really strong players. And I'm sure you have a say in all that, right? Yeah. They, they know a lot more than I do, Kevin. But yeah, <laughs> we've surrounded ourselves with some, as we did with you guys, people who know a lot more about their subjects than we do, but yeah. Well, sure. well so Greg, right now, currently, what is the, what is your official title with Arixa? Yeah. I'm one of the two, one of the two managing directors. So managing director. I'm rescued as the founder and myself, you know, run the business. Uh, my, my primary focus, although we both do a little bit of everything, you know, is really running the day-to-day lending platform, right? You know, which we can talk more about what that involves. But you know, we're involved with investors and some of the institutions we work with and mm-hmm. capital markets. But you know, day-to-day, you're most likely to see me with a borrower, talking to yeah. borrowers, working with the team, and I kind of describe myself a little bit like a an air traffic controller. I've got lots and lots of planes to land. Yep. And we got to bring them all down and get them done on time, and you know, make sure the bride isn't too bumpy. Right. And, um, you know, and keep it going. It's a, you know, it's a high volume, it's a high volume business, a lot of trade. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, and especially considering you guys are a balance sheet lender, you know, you have to do a lot more work than most of your competitors do to evaluate and maintain and, and also keep those borrowers happy. And let's talk about that. So how get, describe Arix's current structure right now and how you, and how, how about how we got there. So my understanding, you, you mentioned Crosswind, but Arixa is a balance sheet lender. You have, Two funds, I believe, right? And they're they're using uh, the REIT strategy. Have you always been? Have, has Arixa always had funds, or has it has there been any other strategy before? No. Yeah, when Jan first started, um, Jan's background, he started his career at Goldman Sachs. And I think mm-hmm. some of his mentors and advisors said, you know, build if you can build a fund and develop a track record, you know, you can really create, you know, a uh, a very viable, sustainable enterprise. So mm-hmm. he's always been track record focused in terms of the investments we've made. If you wanted to go pull our track record, you can see the first loan he did in March of 2010. Right. I think we've done thousands, you know, a th- couple thousand since then. But every single loan, the track record is there. It's documented for the world to see. And right. You know, he's really has been very much part of his his um, his message since the beginning. Um, we run we run one fund that is not a read. Actually, it's an unlevered fund. Mm. Uh, our largest oh, yeah. vehicle is a is a levered REIT with a subsidiary REIT. You and I have been mm-hmm. on panels to discuss this before. Uh, the Crosswind vehicle is a full on REIT. It's not a subsidiary REIT. It's a top level right. REIT. Uh, those are similar size vehicles, and both use leverage uh, warehouse lines from banks. Mm-hmm. And then we have a capital markets arm that 
selectively works with uh, some counterparties on some loan sales. Right. Um, well, that's been a smaller part of the business, but it's important as well. When did you guys um, add that component? Uh, I know the fund has always been there, but like, when do you guys start adding loan sale and liquidity through what capital markets? Um, let's see. So our Crossland fund, when we first started it, and uh, I'll give all like all the credit to that to our other partner, Bob Barth. He brought the concept of working with a commercial bank that he knew mm-hmm. that was not in this space. This is 2013, mind you. This is a mm-hmm. long time ago when the only player in town was Wells Fargo. Um, and uh, he said, well, look, you're going to make a loan at this, at this time at 10 or 11 percent. And you're going to borrow the money at four or five percent. You know, we can do pretty well. Right. So our, our first two years in Crossland, 13 and 14, we were returning 13 and 14 percent to our LPs. So you guys, you guys were able to get a line of credit in 2013 from a bank? Substantial one. That's, that was impossible back then. There were no banks doing credit lines back then in our industry. It was, it was one and they were charging 8%. So that's, that's amazing. So it's a, you know, again, all the credit goes, all the credit goes to him and his relationships and his Fantastic. ability to get that. We started with a very, with a, we launched the Arixa Leverd Fund in January of 14. We got a five million dollar line from a very small LA bank that you mm-hmm. and that was the max. I think we bumped them to seven and we reached their max they could do. Mm-hmm. And then uh we started working with another bank, and that line has grown from 15 up into the nine figures now mm-hmm. over the course of you know the last several years. Um, our first loan sale was probably in 2017. So right around the time it started becoming yeah. a trend. Yeah. And um and, you know, and, and again, it, we, we, we sold a fair bit of loans last year. Right? Mm-hmm. It was a, it, it's always been, I think, all your balance sheet clients have the same issue, which is mm-hmm. either have too much money or not enough money, and it's never exactly. quite right. Yeah. And uh, so I think the one thing we did well, I don't know if we're going to talk about what happened in March of this year, that little, <laughs> that little ker- kerfuffle that hit us. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, you know, the one thing we did do, and I think we talked a lot about it, not knowing what was going to happen, is – don't have a single source of capital. Yep. Don't be, you know, we've had a, we have a really varied balance sheet and mm-hmm. off balance sheet. And it really served us well at that time. And we we'll talk about that if you want, but you know, the, you know, we were always really scared about having all of our eggs in one basket as it related mm-hmm. to capital. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, so, I mean, for those, for the listeners out there who, who aren't like in the industry per se, or on the sidelines, I mean, March, April, May was essentially like we were all, I mean, some people will describe it as doom and gloom. I was just, I, I describe it as everyone just kind of like was had their heads down, popped their heads up and was like, what the hell is going on? It was, I would, say, I would describe it as dazed and confused for those yeah. who don't remember that movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like, what is this craziness going on all of a sudden? Because everything on there, like a lot of my clients, like you, you said the same thing, nothing looks too bad based on what I'm seeing. But the entire industry is losing its mind, and so talk about how, what happened. What happened? March hits. We go into lockdown. California, California goes into full lockdown. You know, you and I are both working from home. I remember the phone call. I was in my I was in my living room. Talked. I'm like Kevin. What's going on out there? <laughs> <laughs> what's happening? You call it's me. Crazy. I call you. Like, and I I I felt that's the same way. Like my clients don't seem to be that worried, but for some reason there is a sense of doom and gloom out there. So tell me about, you know, how Arixa handled it. What, what, what was the decision you guys made, the timelines yeah. and uh, you know, well, how I'll you guys got fun, out of I'll it. You, I'll tell you a funny story. And again, um, so on, on uh, the 13th or the Friday, the Friday before they closed the, our state down, we were finalizing a major, major uh, increase in our primary warehouse line. Mm-hmm. Um, called our banker on that Friday and we're supposed to have docs on Friday. And he goes, I won't have about to until Monday morning. Called him again on Saturday. I'm sorry, you're going to still have the docs out. He goes, we'll have the docs out. On Monday, we got the docs out and we added many, many, many millions of dollars to our available balance sheet that week after COVID. So thank goodness a bank that stood up and did what they were supposed to do. But that was a scary weekend. I was waiting for them to pull it. Right. Well, you know, every, every reason in the world to pull it. So you and every other lender out there that had a bank line was wondering, are we going to get pulled? Yeah. You know, so, but you yes. didn't. They, yeah, they, we, they, we did it, yeah. you know, and th- thanks, thanks to them. So, you know, the first thing we did um, is 
immediately canvassed our clients. So, I mean, again, we're not a national platform. We do some loans in some different states, but we have a pretty close personal relationship, you know, almost like a private bank would have with our clients. So we're dialing on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're just, we're just calling. Hey, Kevin, how are you? What's going on? Everything okay? You know, I did the same thing. <laughs> I called you. <laughs> yeah, you called I think, I think you and I probably talked on Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. You know, are you okay? Is everything okay? You know, yeah. don't lose your mind. Um, and we started, you know, we never really shut down. Like a lot of our loans were active construction sites. Yeah. So we're just going out. I just wanted to go out, go out and meet. I, I met people. I didn't really, you know, I didn't really stop going out and interacting with people. Mm-hmm. And obviously construction did not slow down at all, except a little bit up in the Bay area and Seattle and Portland a little bit, mm-hmm. but, you know, just wanted to make sure everybody knew we're going to fund their draws Yep. and we're going to be here. You know, we had a lot of people that, you know, had some funny requests, you know, um, can you pause on my interest for the next year and not charge me any extension fee? You know, like, no, um, but <laughs> you know, we, we had some interesting conversations. We tried to work with the borrowers, you know, like if you're a borrower who was, in contract to sell your property and COVID pushed your sale or something like that. We tried to be as flexible as we can. That's the biggest right. advantage I will tell. I tell all my clients, like you don't really care who holds your loan until you care. Right. You know, I'm not, it's not in a security. It's not in some servicer who sold it to a subservicer or sold to a subservicer. We service our own loans. We service our own draws. You know, I did draws myself. I went out and did physical draw inspections in March when one of my guys, you know, couldn't do it. You know, so mm-hmm. we're going to make sure if, if you need us, we're going to get somebody out there. And right. without having that balance sheet, Kevin, it would have been really hard. Yeah. You know, we, you know, the good news is we haven't had a single loan go into default or nothing has happened since COVID in our portfolio across our entire book. Really? COVID, which is crazy, right? Not um, even in the commercial stuff. I mean, no, I mean, the, nothing. Now we had people that we wow. worked with in March and April and May. So a lot of it was just trying to assess, you know, going through every loan and saying, okay, what are we worried about? Right. And we, um, you know, we met every commitment we made prior to March 15th, but we, we didn't do any, we didn't do any loans for a few weeks. We really sure. that makes tried sense. to figure out, you know, we had some redemption requests from investors, which a lot of them actually ended up after time, pulling the redemptions that once they saw that the world did not implode. Right. You know, I th- I'm sure you saw that across your clients. Yeah. Um, and then gradually started opening up the door again. Um, and when was that? When did, when did you guys make the realization? Okay. It's time to, it's time to stop with the whole, yeah. you know, well, you, you know, my, you, you know, Jan, I think he was probably a little later than I was in terms of that, but you know, I mean, yeah. I, we turned away some one request that if, you know, were as good as I was joking to some of my clients. It's like, it's 2013, 14 again. Mm-hmm. You know, pricing was, you know, yeah. a lot of people, double digits, right? Yeah. Yeah. I never, mm-hmm. I never tried to do that to people, but you know, the leverage, we definitely cut leverage for a while. Yeah. But it was like, yeah, it was 2014 pricing. Yeah. yeah all of a sudden, but you know, so we, we did a few loans to repeat clients at a little lower leverage. Yeah. I didn't charge them more money. I just didn't feel right. Oh, that's great. To do that. yeah. but, that's great. But you know, I said, Hey, I, I can't go to this leverage attachment. Let's go to this one. Right. And I think late June, um, and there was a lot of demand. And then, you know, July was a normal month. August was a great month. And it's kind of gone back. And I'm sure a lot of your clients, January and February were amazing months. Oh, yeah. Like 2020 is going to be a kick-ass year. Oh, yeah. Oh, so I came into 20. I'm like, this is the year. Year. This is going to be the yeah. year. Everyone's going to kill this year. Like, by March 15th, I'm like, this year is going to suck. Yeah, but, um, yeah, 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 you yeah. Know, I think we've been, we've been lucky. I think a lot of it is, you know, good clients and good communication. And, right. You know, a lot of clients showed stripes. You saw clients who were unbelievably humbled by what it, this had done to other parts of their businesses. Maybe they had a, a construction business. Maybe they had a lot of commercial property. We, we haven't been very heavy in retail or office. We have a few, but you know, I have guys who I would never have thought would ever be of an issue. Kevin, like huge portfolios. All right, Greg, I, you know, I collected 15% of my retail rent right. this month. Right. You know, I'm, I'm two hundred fifty thousand dollars short of my normal monthly cash flow. Let me ask you a question about that because you have these relationships and well, with the owners and the developers, and my my understanding has been the biggest impact has been actually not the small business retail, but the big box real retail. They're like basically saying like Best Buy is basically saying no, we're not paying rent. Yeah, I think it's across the board. I mean, I've got I've got one loan down in San Diego. The guy's got a Mexican restaurant and a bar. Oh, I mean, really? You know, I mean, what do you do? 
That's you know, true. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like I think the strip mall owners have had it bad too. Mm-hmm. You know, if you mm-hmm. just think about businesses that are walk-in service businesses, those that's have been true. Hit. Brick and mortar retail, um, any kind of brick and mortar retail is tough right now. Yeah. You know, but but imagine offices that are coming up on, you know, renewals. Yeah. You know, or earn revenue through other things like parking and stuff. It's, it's pretty tough out there. I mean, we yeah. don't do hotels, thank goodness. Yeah. You know, I think that's been as hard hit as anything. Of course. Um, yeah, the hospitality. Again, we, have, we, have a, we have one in downtown LA where um, it, it's got a mix of office and retail. But, you know, I think the retail was like, I won't get this right, but like a coffee shop, a gym, and a juice bar. Uh-huh. You know, and they signed all these leases and then nobody wanted to move in. Right. I think they've now subsequently have, but you know, my, my sponsor is like, okay, wait a second. That wasn't the, that wasn't my business plan. Mm-hmm. You know, I signed all these leases. I'm ready to bring everybody in and nobody could actually come in. So it, you know, I don't know if we're going to talk about how the SFR market has been performing, but we've, we're probably better lucky than good as it relates to the asset classes we've been in just because they've been. We'll talk about that. So what, what, what was the cop? So before, right, right, right before all this happened, right? What was the kind of the, the ratio? What percent were you in SFR versus commercial, you know, kind of stuff? Cause yeah. that's well, something that a lot of people don't think about. Like how do, how do I balance my prop portfolio if I'm going to be doing, you know, multiple types of, you know, loan classes? Well, so, so obviously our commercial loans are much bigger than our SFR loans. Sure. Our average loan size is, probably surprising to a lot of people. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's well, it's well above 2 million. Right. Our average one. So, you know, that could be a $10 million multifamily, but could also be a $10 million single family. Yeah. And we still well, do $100,000 ones, $200,000, yeah, $300,000 ones too. But, you know, we, um, we're not the high volume shop. We're not the shop doing 150 ones a month. That's right. just not our business. So last year on a dollar volume basis, we were pretty close to 50-50. Mm-hmm. Um, most of our sponsors starting in March just shut down. They, I'm not buying anything else. I'm not refinancing anything. I got to make sure I can collect some rent. Mm -hmm. So we had a number of loans. I think the scariest part for us in March and April, you know, I'm sure most of your clients, we have a pretty steady, I I don't get it perfect, but I know what my payoffs are going to be pretty much, right? Right. So I'm going to get X million of dollars or tens of millions of dollars in payoffs. All of a sudden there was none. Mm. Like nothing paid off in April. Like literally nothing. So, okay, is this a one month thing? Is this a two month thing? Is Mm -hmm. this a year thing? So a lot of our caution was, you know, we had to make sure we can fund all of our draws. We have to keep every commitment. Right. So I think that was our biggest um, caution flag was, when are the payoffs going to start again? They really didn't start in earnest until June. A couple trickled in in May. But then all of a sudden, July, I mean, just, Anything on the market moved. Yeah. So this year, I will say that our origination volume is probably 80, 20 SFR. Mm-hmm. And most of the multifamily is bridge. We're not getting a lot of the uh, last year, it would have been you buy an older building, you relocate tenants, you fix it up, and you retenant it. Yeah. Most of our sponsors kind of took a break this summer. They just they wanted to see what's going to happen with the election. They wanted to see what's going to happen with evictions, which in you know, California and some of these North Pacific Northwest states, it's, um, there's a lot of state mandates coming out as you, have been come out, as you know, it's, it's not an easy circumstance for them to operate in. What I will say is rent collections, which were down in April and May are back up to pre COVID levels for most of our clients, which again, doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't. Um, you know, we're not in the high end space. We're not doing downtown LA, right. you know, many buildings. And we're also not in the you know, kind of the, the, the really low rents or we're kind right. of working class. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of those folks have been able to cobble together their rent. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been constantly surprised. I have a guy, a couple guys of buildings where like, I haven't, you know, haven't missed a single rent. Like, Come on. You know, I don't believe you. It's like, yeah, the, the tenants that we have, or the tenants that we have, you know, they're, they're doing things that they're working like you and I are doing today and they never missed a beat. You know, so it's, it's, it's just been a lot of things that if you and I would have talked about what would happen if we shut down the economy, I don't think yeah. we would have expected to see some of the things. Well, we all there. expected like multifamily to suffer in May and April and April, May, I was expecting a lot of, you know, rental, the rental market and the SFR rental market and the multifamily market to suffer significantly. And come end of May, we started realizing, wait a minute, this is a hundred percent impacting commercial real estate only. 
SFR is not skipping a beat. Multifamily is not skipping a beat. Everyone seems to be able to make their rent payments. Some people were like, yeah, it's a stimulus. I'm like, but that was like $1,200. It doesn't make a difference. Not in your $3,000 a month rent. Exactly. We're in LA. Yeah. Month rent here is, it's, it's expensive. So I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people found a way to make it work. Um, and yeah, then, and, I, yeah, I think, I think, I think you're right. One, I also think that I've also started to see now there's been some transactions and a lot more refis. Multifamily values haven't fallen. Yes. So that's, that's the other thing. I, I thought you'd see a, you know, a 10 or 15% decrease, but with interest rates so low, cap rates have continued to stay super low. Yeah. And for the most part, I'm seeing some appraisals more and more that are coming in. They're at or above our pro forma values pre-COVID. Yeah. And in some cases are above the expectations of our clients on their pro forma values, which again, defies a lot of logic. You know, you hear about that in the SFR market. Obviously it's red hot it's mm-hmm. across the country. All your clients are, are seeing that. But the multifamily has performed, it's been a much more durable asset than I think. No, a lot of I'm folks right. have been reconcentrating into multifamily. And I always, I asked, and, and I always ask, I, I kind of left myself scratching my head because and it ultimately boils down to what you said. Cost of money is so low on the refi and on, you know, it's just, and the agency loans are still there and everything's is still available. So there's no reason not to do it. And rents are being paid. So if you're doing it, if you're investing in B, B class apartments, cap rates are good. Interest is good. good. Values are still solid. I mean, we're seeing valuations, not only, stable we, we were worried about a dip in valuations we didn't see any until until like we came out came out of tail, tail end of may and we only saw it in commercial right. and that came and that happened to funds as well we were we were, we were waiting for corrections to happen in funds larger i watched certain larger funds to see how they're going to perform as an indication of our small our client bases and none of them announced any losses or just or, or deductions until we saw the ones in the hospitality space start to mark things down and i was like oh that's a hotel that's a hotel read that makes sense mm-hmm. and it started be kind of becoming kind of a question mark like what is going on and uh you also, i mean you certainly saw the mortgage i mean we, you know, the mortgage rates got crushed yeah yeah between you know, between march 15th and april 1st you know the one asset class you did not want to hold was a was a basket of mortgage read stocks because they had the dislocation which hurt our industry a lot yeah um, you know, a lot of your clients who worked with some of the publicly traded REITs and, mm-hmm. you know, there was some real liquidity concerns in that space. Yeah. Like, are they going to make it kind of questions? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's and it, it became a question mark. What is causing the crisis upstream when at our level we feel things are doing well? And, you know, personally, I I kind of blame I kind of put the fault at the foot of the uh, repo lines, but you know, a lot of bad repo lines out there, but I mean, you know, it could also be the way they're invested, the way they're levered, the amount, you know, the amount of levers they have. Yeah. We've always been pretty, I mean, we're, we're trying to operate at a one-to-one ratio. We're not trying yeah. to triple or double do three, four times leverage. And yeah, it doesn't take much of a move in three or four terms of leverage to, uh, really put that equity in a bad shape. So. Yeah. If you're, if you're three X leverage, then you're really going to, any, any spike is going to hurt you. So well, let's talk about, you know, so let's talk about kind of building the business, right? Because you guys have a pretty sizable staff now. How many, how many employees now? Um, 31, 31. And, you know, you guys are, you know, lending in about, I think about 10 States right now, five, 10, is it five or 10 States? Yeah, give, I mean, give, like, give or take. Yeah. We've got loans probably in about, 10 states, but, you know, really operating, you know, probably I would say three that you would see us. Three core markets. Right. Interactive, yeah. Right. Right. And big, big name in LA. I mean, everyone knows Arixa in LA and, and Orange County as well. And um, uh, even in the Northwest, you know, some of my local lender clients have, have mentioned you guys doing very well up there. So, but having the amount that you guys have under management and pure balance sheet, you know, tell me about the kind of the hiring process, like who are some of the key hires you guys had over the years? Because I mean, in, initially it must have just been a skeleton crew, right? Just you know, a handful of people for far too long, Kevin. Let me tell, oh, you. Okay, well, tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Jan and I both have a similar history in that we both started. Uh, he started, and I joined very early high tech companies in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, he sold his company to a public company. 
uh, that, that then kind of got caught in the boom. I was uh, pre-IPO, ready to go on a road show in April 2000. Mm-hmm. You know, canceled all those flights, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. And you know, we, we both saw a massive change in what our paper net worth was to um, you know, what it ended up being. And we both were saddled with very large staffs and large overhead. Mm -hmm. You know, my case, big name venture capital firms that wanted, you know, it was, it was go big or go home. Right. And he and I both, as we got older, neither of us wanted to go through that. So we, we probably in retrospect hired too slow. We underinvested in the, you know, in the platform because we, we wanted to make money every single month we were in the business. And we have never had an unprofitable month. So you know, so as we started to staff, you know, I think our MO was hire as many Swiss army knives as we can, mm-hmm. you know, people who could do a lot of different things. Right. And some of our longest standing employees now, and you, you've met some of them, you know, they might've started in an admin role or a processor role and have moved around to credit or origination even, or, you know, other roles. And, you know, they really learned the system and how we do things. And we do things pretty differently, as, as you know. Um, you know, we've hired, you know, senior people in operations and, um, you know, obviously finance staff, and legal mm-hmm. staff and those. But, you know, we were a pretty large company with a staff of 15. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, you know, now we've got some newer hires that we, you know, a couple that we haven't even announced yet or just you know, just very recent. You know, I think now as we look at the business, I think COVID has taught us maybe where some of the gaps were. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have seen that in your business, but you know, yeah. things are, you know, things are, you know, yeah, I wish I had somebody who could do that or, you know, you know, maybe making some changes to the organization. So that's been more of the focus over the, you know, the last few months. You know, obviously everybody we hire on the originations side is a, uh, it's, you know, it's the key. We, we're not big marketers. I mean, mm-hmm. I wish we had your marketing acumen. You guys do fantastic things. Oh, thank you. It's all it's all marketing team. None of my. No, I, no, I, no, I just. I'm not, I just. I'm not assuming the top attorneys <laughs> and are marketing. We don't know leaders. anything. Our we're marketing team is top notch, though. They're fantastic. But, but we, you know, we've tended to be. You know, we're pretty quiet, as you know. I mean, it's so it's we depend on our loan origination staff to yeah. forge relationships, build ties, right? Uh, get referrals. It, it's it's a very much of an organic. Growth. So, you know, each of those people on the origination team have been huge parts of our business. You know, our originators carry a very large book. Um, of those 30 people, uh, you know, I, I, we have very few people that actually do one origination. It's, it's mm-hmm. probably a shockingly low number to your listeners relative to, you know, um, a lot of the companies that are our size. So we expect a lot out of each person. So each of them have been really critical hires. You know, some, some really strong people in credit great closing team and more and more what we've started to do. And, um, you know, we've actually been hiring some people from some of our, who have left, not coaching by any means, but have left some of the better lenders in town Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason. And, you know, I think that institutional knowledge of some of the shops that we have a lot of respect for have been great additions to our team. Nice. And um, we're all doing the same thing. We're just doing it a little bit different way. Right. We've had some closures and some credit people and some folks, I think it brought some great insight and perspective to our platform. And, you know, I, I don't envision us going from 30 to 200, like some of these shops have. And that's, no. I don't, that's just not really what we're trying to do, but right. you, we'll continue to grow and continue to, to add staff. And, you know, we certainly have growth, you know, a lot of growth uh, in front of us. It's just, I think we'll always be a little bit of the slow high, you know, Slow no, lean and, lean and mean, right? I mean, there you guys yeah. came from the world where it's too overstaffed, and we were overstaffed, and we felt it too. Like, you know, what can we do? What can, how can we do more with with less? As COVID came around, and you yeah, know, the, techno- the technology has really lent itself to that. I mean, I um, you know, I was in the I was running a large servicing business before the, during the financial crisis, and you know, I mean, I watched people you know who had been at companies for twenty and thirty years of mortgage business mm-hmm. begging me for a job as a call center rep yeah this is the only job they could get you know in the industry in 2008 and 9 and our industry has been you know has a horrible reputation for staffing correctly mm-hmm. you know we either hire too we either hire too fast or hire too slow yeah but it, it's really a difficult balance so i, I think we want to build it organically i think you know this we don't have a 
an institutional owner or a private equity mm-hmm. owner, you know, so we're one of the larger, maybe, you know, we're the larger independent platforms. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's really up to us in terms of the growth we want and the culture we want. And, right. You know, and, and, and from a platform standpoint, you know, I, I always, I always talk about you guys as kind of an example because you guys have taken it very, taken, taken it very, you, you have built the company organically, but you also have, you know, you don't have someone, I mean, you have people who, I mean, you and Jan can both do both sides of the business, but you're concentrating, you know, highest and best use almost, right? You have the deal flow and originations and you're managing the operations and there's a lot of the, and there's a lot of necessity for that. And we see a lot of operators think about like, you know, how do I grow my business? And also how do I build my team so we can concentrate and grow? Because a lot, a lot of them, we, I have, a, I still have a lot of clients that, you know, this, Either they're too small or they have too many staff, but they don't have people who are at the executive level helping them actually move the ship forward. And like, and talk about that. I mean, I mean, I know you and Jan, you mentioned you have another partner. Are there any other, were there any other kind of senior level hires that really helped move the ship forward or you know, move the ball forward over the years? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we hired, um, you know, we hired a we hired Doug who came from Patch of Land. He's mm-hmm. been a key part of our operational well. team. We hired, you know, our head of capital markets, investor relations. He came from Penny Mac. Dan, you know, we brought on you know good general counsel, um, strong accounting and finance team. Um, we have a lot of people. I mean, you know, like you've met Christina. Christina's been with us for eight years. Oh, yeah. She's very talented and been in a lot of different roles. So, you know, I, I think we've been. One thing we've done well, we've hired some really good people who maybe didn't have the skills or experience at the time, but had a great attitude and a willingness to learn. And they become well, that, some. That's what I wanted to ask you about that as well. Like, how do you select these people, right? What are you looking for in these people? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And um, I will tell you, when we first started, it was like you're trying to find somebody who's willing to take a leap and jump onto your island with you because you didn't true. have a lot. I, I can't pay very much. And I don't have much, you know, much I can guarantee you. But right. Um, you know, I think, look, I think you're looking for people that are smart and curious, willing to ask questions. Uh, the other thing that we really look for in hiring is you got to have a service mentality. Mm-hmm. We we bang this across, you know, their heads all the time. Look, getting a great client, you know, this is, if you're going to be a balance sheet lender, getting a great client and keeping a great client, it's probably the same in your business. It's hard to get great clients you're going to do everything you can to keep them Yep. because if you keep great clients and again, I've been, I've been a, you know, a, a huge advocate of you guys. And if people ask me, I'm, you know, I've, I've referred you business, as you know, that is worth the weight, your weight in gold. And that's how we built our business. Yep. And if you have a really terrible experience, it can, you know, go the other way, 10 X. Yep. So, you know, so we really focus on finding just like we find the right employees we're very particular about the clients we work with. Mm-hmm. I get great loans all the time. It's just not our loan. It's not our borrower. Mm-hmm. So as much as with the employees, we're trying to find the kind of borrowers who appreciate what we do and how we do it. Mm-hmm. And we'll be long-term borrowers, you know, and it, it's, so, you know, I've got, I got to talk to a guy before this call. I mean, he's been borrowing with me for seven years. Wow. You know, you know, he texts me and says, Greg, I had a quick question. Can you give me a call? I haven't talked to him probably in a year. But it's like he's been working for seven years. Right. So he, he he knows what we do. I know what he does. Five minute question, but he feels like he got he got some love. Right. You know, and I talked to him forever. You know, I mean, so that you can build a great service business. I'm sure you guys are the same way. You know. Yeah. You know, you're, I mean, you're, law you're, firms and lending and, and balance sheet lending businesses. I mean, at least are very similar. It's very okay. it's a service business, book of business oriented. Like if you. If you keep your clients happy, they will come back. They're, they're and, a great business. Well, and, and we, and I think you know this, we do our own draws and we do our own servicing. Yeah. We're one of the only guys who do that. There's a couple other, you, have Steve, you know, Steve, who you talked to before, he does as well. Yeah. I don't want anybody else interacting with my client ever. Right. I mean, controlling I wanna, the, controlling I wanna, the interaction. I want to control every interaction. Yeah. yeah. If that interaction is not up to your expectations, I want you to tell me about it. If you yep. didn't get the service, the response, the answers, Jan or I will take a call or one of our other senior people will take a call. It's just, we expect that service interaction 
Look, it's not always between a lender and a borrower. It's not always a kumbaya, right? I mean, you might yeah. have to deal with issues, but I want you to deal with it in a way that still maintains the professionalism of a high quality institution. We, right. we, we really tried to raise the bar and how those interactions happen. So would you say that that's kind of like a core value of the company when it comes white, to like, yeah, service, the service oriented? Is, the exceptional service, white glove service. We have an award we award to our employees for who provided exceptional service voted on by the by the employees. It's, it's really cool. is something that we celebrate and and talk about. And uh, that's great. And when, we have a real, and when we have something that goes the other way, we talk about that too. I mean, it's a, that's a learning experience. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a really important part of what we do. And, you know, if I lose a client that I really want, I mean, it's, uh, I take it personally. Yeah. And it stings because you you work so hard to build that, not only culture, but, you know, that relationship. So, I mean, it's, and it can go sideways with just one bad interaction. Right? It, that's it isn't you or me. It's, it could be somebody on your staff. It could yeah, be yeah, yeah. your administrative yeah. assistant. It could be a, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's got to go from top to bottom, I think, if you're trying to build that kind of culture. 100%. 100%. So, I mean, right now, with 30 employees, and, you know, you guys are, you guys are, I mean, not only stabilized, but you, you guys are growing. You know, LA, LA markets and Northwestern markets have stabilized. Things are on looking up. Let's talk about where we're going. Well, where's the RICSA going? What's, what's, what's the plan for 2021? What's, what are you guys excited about? You no, know, um, so we have a, we are going to announce, we're going to have an institutional separately managed account in 2021, um, a pretty high profile uh, uh, investor. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will be more in the commercial space, but that's an exciting development for us. And I think it's a, a long time goal of, of, of Jan's to, you know, really bring most of our investor base. We have, you know, we have kind of close to a thousand investors are mostly retail, you know, mm -hmm. some family offices and RAs, but it's not traditional institutional right. companies. So we're excited about that. Um, I think we're going to, there will be some new markets that we're going to go in and try to replicate the strategy that we have, um, which we're excited about as well. But I can say probably for the first time in probably four or five years, it finally feels that we have our capital sufficient and right-sized for origination. Mm. I spent many, many years kind of chasing my tail or ch we've been chasing our tail where, you know, you, you have more origination demand and interest than you have the ability to, to capitalize. Mm. And um, yeah, it's, a frust it's a frustrating place to be. It's yeah. a good place. You'd rather have Capital more constraints are always a, I mean, and that's the reality for balance lenders. It's, it's it, always more deals than money. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think that's the way for everybody, but it certainly was. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the trend, yeah. the trend tends to be the the ones that are you know having service oriented and you know yeah, you know, but it, but going well, into I, I say balance sheet money, not not right. not not Wall Street money, but yeah, yeah, not Wall Street money. There's always plenty of that, but yeah, plenty so, of that. Yeah. So going into 2021, I'm I think I'm ex I'm excited about some of the new staff and really feeling like the business is well capitalized to you know you know, to, to, to really take care of the clients the way I'd like to take care of. And, you know, we're winning a lot of new clients. I, um, I wish I had the answers, you know, my, my, my LOs say it's all them and maybe it is, but, you know, we've been able to acquire some new customer relationships over mm -hmm. the last three to six months, which I'll be honest, I think before COVID, I don't think there's any way I would have been able to win this business. Mm -hmm. And, um, I can't put my finger on it. I think it's different across different organizations, but there mm -hmm. were, um, I think our industry struggled between, you know, we're not a giant industry with, you know, tens of thousands of staff that you can, yeah. I, I think we, I think we, um, we stumbled a li little bit between March and June. I think some companies failed to, you know, keep their engines running the way they were, yeah. had some missteps um, and maybe soured a few relationships. I think so too. Um, I mean, there, there. I definitely think a lot of key players either created like their exit or their failures created some kind of vacuum. Um, but it feels it feels it, feel, it feels like that. And I'm hearing, yeah. you know, I've heard some horror stories of things, and I'm not going to put anybody out here, but of companies I hold in high esteem who really, really let some clients down, like long term clients, just yeah. not meeting commitments and not right. responding the way you and I would expect them to respond. And there could be a thousand reasons for that, but I'm excited about some of these new clients, Kevin. I mean, you know, clients who do 10, 15, 20 transactions a year, really experts in the markets or the products right. that they are. And 
uh, you can build a hell of a business with those kind of clients. You know, yeah, exactly. I like to say, you know, fifty clients doing twenty million a year with me is a billion dollars business. So, exactly, exactly. You know, but it doesn't take and five thousand. And that goes to that goes, but well, that's a credit to the stability that you guys had during the crisis. Because what I was what I was finding is there were some people that were like. The reaction, it was, it was as the reaction felt like when I, some interactions as if 08 was happening again. I'm like, this isn't 08, guys. This doesn't feel like 08. I kept saying, this doesn't feel like 08. This feels a little bit weird. This feels a little bit strange. It's not, it's, 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 this is a crisis, but I don't think it's 08. But some people were just. I'm glad you were right. I was being optimistic and I was like, yeah. I, I and people were calling me, you're being optimistic. I'm like, I, I don't know, guys. I mean, you know, there's there's this is this is all kind of like artificial almost. Like this is the government forcing us to stop. Like it's not it's not like the values have just tanked all of a sudden. It's not like all of a sudden it's not like all of a sudden there's hundred thousand homes. I don't know if you remember in 08, you put a home for sale and it was like crickets. Yeah, you couldn't give it away. Yeah, I mean There's the no inventory way. comparisons were. Yeah. I mean, no, no sorry. inventory now. Yeah, no right. inventory. And, and 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 that was the one thing I was telling people. Like, there's there's still so little inventory out there. I mean, simple simple thing. Go on to Zillow and watch the house values increase. And, and, they, and they have. They have. My house went up twenty percent during COVID. I was like, what the hell. It's like Tesla so, stock. It's like Tesla stock over it's there. It's like Tesla right? stock. Yeah. I <laughs> know, no joke. And 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 it's one of those things where we were talking about like there's this is different. This is very, very different. And um, you know, I think that the 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 funds and and you know, it's interesting because I'm I'm in the fund business, so a form fund formation business, yeah. All of the clients that were managing, you know, about you know, 20 to 20 to 100, right? They were do everyone did okay. Everyone, no one really suffered that much. I haven't seen yeah. a single one, except for the hospitality funds. I mean, that's yeah, the first. Yeah, I understand. But if you're in a mortgage, if in the mortgage fund business, and you're in your balance sheet lender, and you 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 stayed, you know, disciplined and and customer service oriented, they all all of my clients seem to be doing well. If not, they're excelling. Like we have one client in Arizona, like it allowed him to grab so much market share in his local community. That he basically was able to, kind of similar to yourself, he would attract a big institutional investor. It's amazing what people are doing, and they, and it. I don't know. I what, I don't know if it's optimism. Do you think it's optimism? I don't know what it. I mean, is it stability? What is it? I mean, well, look. I, I think the one thing, look, if if I'm trying to you know try to glean lessons and you know, so look, hopefully we never have crisis management involving a pandemic in your and I's professional career. Yeah, and, seriously. But you know, the one thing is, I know you did this too. It's like. You listened to your clients. You had empathy for your clients. Um, you know, you, you know, you could tell that you care and you just, you don't, you don't feed them, you don't feed them BS. Yeah. So a good client would call me and say, Greg, I, I need to do this loan. I'm like, look, Kevin, I can't help you right now. Here's why I can't help you. Right. As soon as I can't help you, I'll let you know. And just trying to be direct. I mean, you know, we were hearing stories of people were calling their, their guy at XYZ company and nobody answered the phone for a month. Yeah. Like, they never got a call back. We they had some. Know. We had some. We heard some stories of being of of lenders being overly aggressive, worrying that they weren't going to be able to foreclose. And I was like, "That's not what you want to do here. This guy's gonna you're gonna burn that bridge forever." Well, and, and we saw we saw clients who needed capital. Basically, I know we saw a bunch of these. April thirtieth, your loan's matured. You need to pay it off. Well, I can't. Okay, here's the NOD. I'm going to foreclose on you. I. Just you know, almost like they were trying to capital raise through payoffs. Yeah, and boy, that that doesn't sit well, Kevin. That's a that's no, a customer, it's loss customer for life. service. Customer it's service. Customer, it's customer yeah. loss for life. Exactly. You burn that bridge. That you basically did him dirty, and he's never gonna. Why would he? Especially in this market. Especially if you're in the Southern California market. There's so much competition. I mean, uh, I don't think I'm the smartest guy in the room, but I was just trying to treat people. You know. The, a little bit of no, the it, it goes to the integrity thing, right? We always talk about integrity and and just be there for people and be honest and care well, and care about and care about their well being. You know, exactly. You know, it, it, I, I didn't start with, "Hey, Kevin, how's your how's your fix and flip project? How's your family? Right? Is everybody right, safe? Right, Is right, everybody right, healthy? Right. You know, how are you doing? You hold right. up okay? I'm just, you know, people. I just think it's the right way to treat your clients who are the lifeblood of your business. Right. Well, speaking of family, I do want to bring this up because you. 
You you have a three year old, right? He's a three year old. We, we our kids are the same age. You have a three year old, yeah, right? My, my son was born in June of twelve or June June twelfth June of two thousand and seventeen. So three and a half years old next. Three and a half yeah. years old. So my daughter was born in November of, of seventeen, and I remember we were talking about we were having drinks in Las Vegas, talking about having kids, and um, the craziness of that. How's how's that been for you during all this nonsense? You know. It, are oh, schools I mean, open? I mean, is he in school or is he? No, he's not. He's not. So, um, so I have an office that's about a mile from my house. So I, I get a little bit of sanity. I'm probably been in the office and out more than you have. You're doing what, what Nima's doing that. He goes to the yeah. office every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really, so I can actually, I go to my, I go to my office so I can work, but, right. I, but I'm also out almost every single day with clients. I just have been, um, Nice. My, my, my joke yesterday was I was having a legal private gathering with people outside of my household. So don't ticket me. for. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All of a sudden you get a ticket from Gavin Newsom, right? Yeah. yeah. I, was, oh, I, was, I was legally meeting with two clients on their project site, but um, no, I mean, being a, being a dad, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a lot older than you are, but being a dad has been, you know, a giant change in my life. Um, he's amazing. You know, he's at the age, I'm sure you know, your daughter is too, you know, he's in his, what is this stage? Oh yeah. Daddy, what is this? Daddy, what is this? Daddy, what oh, is this? Yeah. Daddy, what is this? And uh, you know, just learning. You know, he's learning like a, a sponge, and it's been a, been a lot of fun. His little boy, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to be able to interact with kids again. I'm sure you're the same way with your daughter, and just I wish I wish you had more of that to do right now. So that's the you can't go out and do anything. Like you can't yeah. like yeah like they they op- they they opened a playground near me, and I was like, thank you. God, because like, what am I gonna do in the house? I had to buy like I had to buy like a swing set to put in my house I because tra- like I have a trampoline in mine. Yeah, because so, like, yeah. what else? Can, what can you do? So yeah, um, well, he won't wear. My son will not wear his mask. He will not. I don't know if it took me about it took me about three months to get her to wear a mask. Oh, he will not yeah. do it. So it's like we were in. I actually took him over for the uh, at the the Apple conference that you know mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago, and I was like. You know, I, he's a he's a big boy, so I'm like, mm. I'm gonna run him through the casino because he won't put a mask on. I'm like, you know, what are they gonna do? They're gonna throw him out. They're gonna kick my son out of the casino. I don't know. Get out of here. You know? Do they care at all? I mean, I don't care what kids do they. I mean, it's not a big deal with kids, are they? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just, you know, a lot of these places are don't no mask, no entry. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you yeah. Know, he's a. I mean, he's he's you know, he's a big boy. You, yeah, you, I remember. Yeah, yeah. He's a bit, he's bought bigger than even you saw. So. So I just, that's, that's, the, that's the challenging part, but being a dad, you know, it's, it's been. Well, they're never going to do what you want. Right. I mean, it took my kid, but yeah, three months for her. And it only, it will only work because there are all these other girls at this one, at this one place we were going to, and so they were cool. all wearing cool. masks. It was, it was cool. cool. So yeah. she started, okay, I'll wear a mask. I'll wear, 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 wear a mask now. And now she asks for her mask. And oh, now okay. it's, it's, well, maybe we'll get there, but you know, you'll get there. The good, you know, the good thing is, you know, obviously you get to see them a lot more than you ever would. That's true. But it's still challenging, you know, to patience. You know, think, the patience well, is hard. Dad, dad's home, let's play, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, dad's home, let's work. Cause dad's yeah. to do. Yeah. No, I've had many times I'm in my home office for those who got this is fake. And <laughs> many phone calls and she just comes running right in. Thankfully, we, we started school. Schools here are open, so it's been better. It's okay, well, well, good. without school, my wife would have lost. But I lost her mind. So uh, yeah, she ever. I, I, I do these weekly production meetings. Every once in a while, I got twenty people on my Zoom call. He jumps up, climbs up on my lap, waves at everybody on the call. You know, nice. Like, so they all nice. they all know him now. So. Nice. There you go. Right. <laughs> Very cool. I want to kind of talk about. I mean, we talk about kind of some of the issues that came up during the pandemic and some of the legal changes. You mentioned some of the foreclosure regulations. One thing that I want to bring up because it's something that you know I think that you probably have some insight on is some of the local regulations in California that have come, that have come up in the last election. These ballot measures. You know, um, one of them is a tax related one. They're adding a tax to essentially proper, like they're adding taxes to properties that, that, that shouldn't, and basically they're raising taxes on real estate, on commercial real estate and all types. Uh, I think it's prop 19. I really want to get your take on it because you guys work so deep you guys have so many relationships in the LA area in, in California. And a lot of these folks are, you know, touching, you know, working with legacy real estate, and so, how do you think it's going to play out? And give us a, give us a, give us a, your, your thoughts on it. We actually just put this in a recent investment commentary for, for our investors too. So, um, I think what you're referring to specifically, you know, there are three, there are three ballot propositions this year, 15, 19, and 21. 
15 and 21 did not pass. Um, for those listeners who aren't California residents, we have a 1978 law in the books called Proposition 13, which limits property taxes to a 1975 and 76 assessed value with an inflation index, but it, it capture increases property taxes. So unlike a lot of states around the country, I would say you and I are neighbors. Um, I've lived there for 20 years and I bought the house for a hundred thousand and you came in and you bought the same house for a million dollars. Your taxes would be 10 times my taxes, yeah. even though we live in a house of similar value. So what it does is keeps people in their homes for a very long time in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. So Prop 19, which did pass, was the only proposition that passed, basically allows portability for people 55 and over to move out of that house and keep the property tax break that they had in their existing residence. So this was very heavily pushed by the California Association of Realtors because there's a lot of people who are would like to leave their homes and maybe go to a new home or even downsize, but feel trapped by the property taxes and the amount of taxes that would go up in their monthly expenses if they moved. Yeah. So that passed, but, but, in, but also passed in that same proposition is, you know, let's say you and I, you know, decide to give our property someday to our children, they would get the, they would have gotten until this proposition passed, they would have held our basis. So, you know, you have a $10 million house and you bought it for a million dollars. It's, you know, you could have passed it on to your heirs. Mm-hmm. And to just give people a sense, I think the numbers I read in the last 10 years have been over 650,000 properties in the state of California that have been inherited or passed, transferred. Mm-hmm. And the lower basis stayed. So um, all of a sudden, these people are now in 2021 going to have their property taxes assessed, not based on what was given to them, but based on the current value. So we believe this could be a giant tailwind for our fix and flip investors and new inventory of older homes finally coming on the market. Um, which is exactly what we want. We're, we're it's always been a problem in California. Well, the old just, aging it, inventory becoming part of the uh, the inventory out there for for, for builders. It's, it's been a huge issue, right? And that's why so many of our cities, for those who don't live out here, you know, it's just, you have like beautiful home, beautiful home, beautiful home, home that looks like it was built in 1955 and never changed. My parents' home. neighborhood's like that. It's yeah. it, it, literally it, like three houses down. It's like a shack. It's like, what? <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and again, if what you're seeing, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of funny, funny stories. I think uh, I think they called it the Big Lebowski because there's Jeff Bridges had a house in Malibu that he inherited. And it's a funny yeah. story about about that one. But, yeah, you could have a property that you're collecting huge rent on that you have no property taxes on. Yeah. So the question is, do you now as a as an inherited homeowner in a you know second home, third home, whatever it might be? Does that make sense for you to keep it? Or does that shack suddenly go to the market? One of our clients buys it, turns it into the other beautiful house, like the other three, and creates additional inventory and new inventory. So, And this only applies to residential or this applies to everything else? Just that so far. So, um, so, you know, we'll see how it plays itself out. I just think if you really go through the math of what this looks like, we think there could be a really interesting push of inventory when that math starts to come to these property owners who have inherited appreciated property, we hope, look, that's the beauty about our cities here, all you know, San Diego, San Francisco, Orange County. It's just, it's just old stock. Yep. You know, not, not everyone in Orange County. You guys have some newer cities down there. Oh, but still you get a lot of aging inventory out here, even in the newer, these new cities, it's old neighborhoods and they have to figure out what to do with them. Yeah. And that's what our clients do. So I, 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 I think problem 19 will get a lot more, uh, be a lot more information about it. I don't think everyone's prop. I don't think people look at prop 19, like maybe you and I would look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking about it, not for, you know, 55 year old and older being able to be portable. I'm thinking about inventory, right. You know, creating opportunities. I mean, critics, critics of the bill were basically talking about it as a, as a wealth tax or an inheritance tax or something like that. But, you know, it incentivizes releasing the, 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 the real estate to the marketplace. So, I mean, that's one thing that's good, you know, so. It is, it, it, look, it is an inheritance tax. There's yeah. no question, but I, I do think for what we have, and I mean, California has been very well documented. We have a giant inventory, giant supply shortage. Mm-hmm. We need more homes, young families like your family, they need homes, yep. you know, and it, you know, our clients need to 
be there to help provide that inventory. So I, right. I really do hope it unleashes, you know, we can absorb hundreds of thousands of properties in the next three to five years if they, if they oh, want yeah. to bring them out without even missing a beat. I mean, they, uh, that's the, been the challenge is that, I mean, they, they're building new communities, but they're too expensive, right? Or they're building, they're building. Or, or not where you want to be. I don't know about you. I mean, yeah. you know, there's something about living in a neighborhood with a sidewalk yeah. and people that have lived there. And, you know, as opposed to like going 25 miles away, into a greenfield subdivision. Why don't no, you- they're doing that here where I live in Brea. They're, they're building in the, the old oil, oil fields and it's it literally in the mountains. And you're surrounded by grass, by those grasshopper things. Yeah. And it's just like, it's not really Brea. It's not really, you're not really in a community. We live in like right now it's downtown Brea. And I couldn't imagine living up in the hills like that. Just, and it's a brand yeah, new division. You want to be in a neighborhood, you know, like you yeah. want the charm you want, you know, so, yeah. Yeah. so I'm, I'm excited to see what, so what happened. And this is all through California. This is, you know, to Sacramento, to San Diego. And, you know, it's not a, it's a state. It's a big problem in the Bay too. You have a lot of aging inventory in the Alameda County area, a lot of old properties in Sacramento. So, I mean, San it's San, San Diego, you know, San Diego too. Side, Escondido. Yeah. 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 So Well, that's so, great. Actually. I, I, you know, one of the insights that I wanted to get on that well, cause is I viewed it from a tax standpoint and I'm, you know, I, I, I'm always like, you know, wait, how does this impact my clients from a tax standpoint? But you made a good point. It releases more inventory into the marketplace. So it incentivizes the sale of real estate. So, which also helps the property values for all the other people around there, right? So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so talking about because you said the impact on long term. So, let's talk about where the industry, I want to get out a crystal ball as we close this great interview. And, you know, you've, you've been in the industry long, long enough to know, you know, this real estate is cyclical. The pandemic did not necessarily, you know, negatively impact values that much. So where where is our industry going? Where are we going next year? You know, how, what do you see? Well, look, I, I think the one thing you and I have both seen in the last three or four years is look, there's there's consolidation happening. Yeah. There are big shops. Um, you know, Finance of America, Blackstone got a publicly traded SPAC. You know, so you mm-hmm. now got a publicly traded company that does what we do. Um Corvest, it's a great company. Five Arch, great company, both acquired by a publicly traded Reed, Redwood. Um, you know, you and I both know folks that are trying to um, roll up platforms and purchase companies. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Genesis was purchased by Goldman Sachs. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Anchor is owned by, you know, by Wafra. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, you've got very, very large institutional players and some of these platforms are backed by very large institutional players. None of them strike me as being low on ambition. So, you know, it just, I think you're going to see a pretty steady dose of consolidation. Well, that's what we were hoping for. That's what we we're expecting this year. I'm hoping for. Like, sure, yeah, no, this year. Nobody did anything this year, really. Yeah, but, yeah. You, know, but, you know, you saw Broadmark have a public read. It's been quite yeah. successful. Yeah. So um, I think on all accounts, and obviously they got hurt in March, but they rebounded nicely. So I think, you know, consolidation and scale and, pro- and, and again, as the capital markets get more and more sophisticated, more and more commoditization of what the programs and products look like that, you know, I think if you and I looked at what people were offering in February, if we said, send me your term sheet, they all would look the same. Yeah. Everybody was providing the exact same product and pricing and, leverage. And so, so it feels like we're moving down a path of scale, commoditization, institu- institutionalization, if that's even a word, you know, of this being a really important part of the alternative investment universe. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you're seeing the you know, Apollo Athene, you know, giant players who have, you know, massive fixed income portfolios, you know, KKR was behind Turek. You know, these are some of the you know, most sophisticated investors in the globe, mm-hmm. and they've they've honed in on our strategy. Yep, they like it. They're making investments. They're building platforms, investing in platforms. So that momentum is, seems to me like we're almost like where the SFR rental space was maybe five years ago, six years ago when you first started to hear about invitation homes and American homes for yep. rent. Now these are massive companies, right? Very very large value um, creation feels like our industry is getting some of that, you know, maybe, maybe pixie dust, dust sprinkled on us. If I was to maybe draw the comparison. Yeah. Yeah. I just hope that we don't end up in a, what I would, what I, what I kind of call like the, the, 
the standardization that we uh, you saw in the conventional market and like you know the domination of you know agency and kind of everything being designed to revolve around that i i i just hope i like the fact that our industry is kind of fractured still well, actually i think it's still pretty fractured i like it because it creates a lot of different avenues for uh for entrepreneurialism and you have a lot of different strategies that come out and if standardization becomes once you get commoditization you get standardization and you know, a lot of lenders don't do the same types of loans. And I well, like that. You know? I will be, I'll be the last man standing. I'll be the survivor kicking and screaming because, you know, my entire value proposition and anybody who's ever dealt with me knows I don't have a term sheet or, or I don't have a, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a pricing sheet or pricing terms. Right. I have a conversation. Right. And I, my job is to find something on my balance sheet that works and is a solution for what you need. And, Right. Hopefully, I can continue to do that as long as I'm in the business, and right. you know, and because if we start operating off of fixed matrices, then we're we're no different than the conventional market, and we're you know, so well, you know. But, but but you and I both know most most shops who have heavy capital market and loan sale businesses, they do, and we know we know yeah. them. You and I both know, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it is. It's a very, I mean, the securities that are coming out now. There's a lot of securitization being done. Oh yeah, yeah, that's and, a different job. Those, yeah. those are very defined. It's you know, I looked at a tape the other day and it's a remittance tape. It reminded me of 2007. I got FICO bands and I've got this band and that yeah, band. And that's it, true. It, 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 it was 2007. It was like a, it was like a, sub, I don't want to call it this, it was like a subprime securitization table. No, it is. It, it, it was exactly the same. And it's, but it's our, it's our, it's our industry's product, like fix and flip. And, exactly. So, yeah, so I, yeah. I don't want to be that. You know, I, the, the fun of the industry for me and anybody who knows me, I love the structure. I love yeah. the deal, the art of the deal. Let's talk about your projects. Yeah, that's what's yeah. Fun for me, and that's I what I worry know. about is that we lose that appeal. A lot of balanced lenders feel the same way, and you you get commoditization, you start losing that ability to be nimble and flexible. And you know, hey, if this guy is a repeat borrower, maybe we can do some extra things for him or whatever. You know, so. whatever, whatever it takes. To, yeah. So hopefully that doesn't happen until I'm uh, I'm I'm retired and out of the industry and have my feet up on a, you know, a beat <laughs> somewhere. But uh, but I think I think it's coming. Look, I think most people are going to end up going to where the money is the cheapest and that's true capital markets and wall street they tend to productize stuff and they're yep. very good at it yeah that's very true well greg i think that's all the time we have today thank you so much for your insight and this was a lot of fun all right Kevin, uh, i always enjoy talking to you i know yeah. right when are we gonna when are we gonna hang out next is it gonna be vegas is it gonna be newport well, well no I, I can take you to a coffee because pasadena is open other than that i can't take you in la county so <laughs> i think well, that orange county is like, open I, 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 yeah i think in orange county i could buy you a beer in laguna right i mean I yeah I mean, I, I, honestly a lot of places here is they saying until the police come we're not going to stay open so yeah not not quite that way in la I have to, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well I hope, hope to see you soon kevin hope to see you I'll, soon I'll to and we'll 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 be doing a, a live event soon so you definitely will see you there so all right I'll talk to you soon greg you take you care all. Thanks, all right bye <laughs>